So at this point we have added in the standard 3 view layout and we have added in the model dimensions. So what's next on the agenda? Next up we want to save out this drawing and we don't want to just do a save 3 like we did up here because that's going to save over this template as you could call it. Instead we want a new drawing file called support.sldDRW so we want it to have the same name as the original part and then we also want a DXF file saved out and that'll also be called support.dxf and we do want them saved out in the folder of the originating documents. So that's one criteria we want to include. So how are we going to do that? Well let's go into the API help and let's go back to the topic called document and let's scroll down to save and save as. So earlier we did save and now you might think all right great we'll just double click on save as and whatever it takes me to here we'll use that. Well this is one of those weird things about the API help. Sometimes it does not always take you to exactly the most useful API call. So in this case it says sets the save as file name from within the file save as notify to event handlers blah blah blah. Long story short this doesn't make any sense to what we're doing and you probably don't understand what it means that's fine. Basically this is saying leave go back and find something else. So instead let's try clicking on the save topic again and you might remember earlier there was save 3 but then there was also this save as. Okay, and why this does not show up when you double click on save as is anybody's guess, but uh, it's really the one that ought to show up. And if we double click on it, it says saves the document to a different name. And it's also found under iModel doc extension. We already know how to get access to that, so this should work out great. So how do we use this? Let's take a look at the parameters. First of all, a parameter called name. New name of the document. The file extension indicates any conversion that should be performed, for example, part1.igs to save to igis. What this is basically saying is that if we want to save out our drawing as like a DXF or a DWG or a PDF or you know a part to igis, that kind of thing, then all we need to do is specify the appropriate file extension and it'll do that conversion for us automatically. That's a really useful thing. So in our case, we are going to take advantage of that to save out to DXF. Now, what I don't like about this description is that really they ought to be saying that you need to specify the entire path name. Now, you don't have to if you're going to save to the current folder, but really it's a good idea to use the full path name anyway. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And then below this is version. So format in which to save this document to as defined in here. And so we're just going to do save as current version. It says this is the typical save behavior. And then otherwise we can do like detached drawing, uh, pro e format, standard drawing, and then this guy that's obsolete and no longer used. So in our case, it's pretty obvious we're just going to use that first option. Then down below that option indicating how to save the document. Again, this is just where we're going to use um, silent again. And that's the only one we'll use there. Export data. So again, kind of like with the last method we looked at, this is expecting an object. However, since we're not exporting drawing sheets to PDF, it says or nothing, or it can be nothing. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to put in nothing. Then again, here's errors and warnings. We're not going to mess with those, so we'll put in empty. Return value is just true if the save was successful and false if not. So this shouldn't be uh, too hard to utilize. Let's go back and start inputting this. Now before we go back to the code window and start typing all this in, I mentioned that I want this new drawing to be saved out to the same folder that the other documents already reside in. So if I go back to the code window, I know what the full path of the original model is, but how do I just get the directory out of that path? Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to use what is called the replace function. So let me type in a comment and I'll say replace SLD PRT with SLD DRW. So basically, I'm going to modify STR model path so that everything is the same except the extension. 
And to do that, we'll use the replace function. And there's really three arguments here we need to use. First of all, the expression. So this is the original expression and it's going to be str model path. That's what we're going to be modifying. And then find, what are we looking for as string? We're looking for SLD PRT, and then we're replacing it with SLD DRW. And what's gonna happen is the resulting string in which the replace occurred, we're going to set that equal to str model path. So basically we're changing str model path. And now what we'll do is we'll say save out drawing and I'll type in swmodel.extension using extension because this save as method belongs under imodel.extension and then for the name we'll put in str model path and this is going to be again the exact same name as the part only SLD DRW on the end and now for version as long let's grab this current version that I mentioned earlier paste that in for options, go back here, grab an option. We'll just do the silent one, paste that, put in the underscore, wrap to the next line, export data. I said we're not going to use that, so we'll just put in nothing, and then errors and warnings we're not going to use, so we'll just put in empty. So this should save out the drawing. So let's test this out. Save, go back to the part, close out of this, going to hit my reload shortcut so it reloads the original and now let's run this let's also just make sure that uh, the only drawing that exists is that original template and it does so let's run this and now let's go in here so here it did save it support.sld DRW and indeed that is the one we're looking at right now. So it looks like everything is working A-OK. -okay. And just so you know, you don't have to keep coming in here and deleting this out. It'll keep writing over it. So let's come in here and now let's add similar code except for the DXF. So we're going to do the same thing we did up here, except we're going to replace SLD DRW with D. XF. And don't feel like you have to use capitals here. I'm just uh, using capitals out of preference. But let's change that to SLD DRW and then DXF. And then everything's going to stay the same. So we'll just say change this so it says save out DXF. And now let's save this. Make sure that we're in the original. Okay, and now let's run this. Okay, make sure that annoying balloon goes away. Come in here and not only have we incremented the time so it looks like there was a new save, but we've also saved out a DXF. So it looks like everything's working the way we want. Now, before we move on to creating the user form, I want to talk very briefly about debugging. When you write code, you're going to spend most of the time either researching API calls or finding bugs and fixing them. And thus far, I haven't really showed you any of the debugging tools because I know what code to type in, I know it's going to work, so consequently we haven't really run into any errors. And I definitely don't want to give you the impression that that's always going to happen when you're coding. It's not. You're going to spend most of your time doing things like debugging. So one of the most powerful debugging tools you have are breakpoints. And breakpoints let you stop at a particular line of code, and that way you can more easily investigate whether a certain line of code is working. So for example, let's say that there's some ambiguity as to whether this force rebuild three is actually successfully running. What we could do is put a breakpoint um, on this line and notice all I did was come over here and I clicked in this gray area. And by the way, you can put as many breakpoints as you want throughout your code. You can't put them on dim statements because nothing is happening there except a memory is being reserved. But beyond that, you can put as many breakpoints as you want in your code. And if we close out of this and reload our part, then um, what we can do is click run and it will stop at this line. So notice it's yellow and it has not run this line yet. It's run all the lines above it, but it's not run this. And what we can do at this point is go back to our part, investigate it, 
We notice that it doesn't look like the 15 millimeters has been applied yet. Well, it has been applied to the diameter. It's just not showing in the display window because a rebuild has not occurred. But then if I click run, it'll keep running the code and it will, of course, cause the rebuild. But I don't want to keep running all the code. Instead, I just want to run the single line. So what I'm going to do is hit F8. And when I hit F8, it runs that line and it jumps down to the next line. And then if I go back to the part, notice now the 15 millimeters is visible in the display window. So this is really useful for isolating a certain line and determining which line is causing you trouble if you're not getting the result you want. Another nice thing is that you can move your mouse over variables and see what the variable is equal to. So right now, STR model path was just declared, so consequently it should be a zero length string. And you can see when I put my mouse over it, indeed, it says STR model path equals, and then just two quotes, or zero length string, or empty, or whatever you want to call it. But then if I hit F8, it jumps down here, and now watch what happens. If I put my mouse over it, it has the file path. So this way I can determine whether, say, an object is still nothing or not, or whether a string or an integer or a double is the value I expect it to be. So again, this is using breakpoints and F8 to just step through your code. Again, if you want to run the rest of the code all the way to the end, just come up here and click the Run button. Although if you have another breakpoint set down here, it'll just run through all the other lines between this yellow line and the red line until it gets to uh, the red line or the breakpoint. So again, that's using breakpoints and I'll go ahead and run the rest of the way through that. And with that, let's now move on to user forms. So to add a form to this macro, what we're going to do is we're going to come over here in the Project Explorer and we're going to right click and we're going to go to Insert User Form. And when I click on this, well, first of all, if you have that balloon coming up, uh, just go ahead and get out of the drawing. I'll go ahead and reload that. All right, now we're to the user form. Notice that before we were in this module called support and now we are in this user form. And if you double click on it, it'll take you to what the form looks like. However, you can actually right click and also view the code because there is code behind this user form that is associated with the different controls on the user form. So right now, if we look at that code, it's blank. There's nothing in it and then we can go back to view object if we want. And basically this is where we get to design what the form looks like. So starting off, I don't like the name, just user form one. So what I'm going to do is once I have a control selected, I'm going to come down to the properties window. And what I can do is I can change basically any of the properties associated with that control. And there's all kinds of different properties you can mess with. But the one I'm interested in right now is caption. So don't get that confused with name. Name is what Visual Basic for Applications understands the name of that form to be. So if I want to run any methods or properties related to the form, I would type user form one dot. And then we'll see how that works in a moment. But uh, for now, I just want to change the caption. So I'm going to change it to add configuration. And then what I'm going to do is come back up here and click on the user form. And I'm going to come over here to the toolbox and click label. And basically, when you click on a control over here, you have the option to come into the user form and click and drag. So I'm clicking and I'm dragging. And I've added a label just like that, which you can then move around, resize, that kind of thing. So let's I'll take it back to where it was and I'm going to change the caption again, and I'm going to say enter whole diameter in millimeters. So after I've entered that label, I'm then going to go over here and grab a text box. So grab that and drag it out, make it a little bit smaller. And this is a little different from the user form and the label in that I do want to change the name. I don't like text box name. I want to give it a more meaningful name. So I'm going to call it TXT Diameter. And you see how I'm using a little prefix. 
Well, basically in the case of the label and the user form, I didn't change uh, the name because I know there's only gonna be one user form and it'll be called user form one. And then label, I'm not even gonna mess with that in the code, so I don't really care what it's called. But this, I am going to have to get whatever text is inside of it, so I do care about the name, and so I'm giving it a meaningful name, txt diameter. So they'll enter the diameter in there, and then I want them to click an add configuration button. So I'm going to come over here, click on the command button, and then come back in here and drag this out. And as with the text box up here, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to give this a more meaningful name. So I'm going to call this CMD add because they're going to use it to add a configuration. Obviously, I also don't like this caption, so I'm going to come down to the caption property and change this to add configuration. And then finally below that, I'm going to add a checkbox. So click checkbox and then drag this out. You can make that a little bit bigger. And I'm going to change this to chk create draw. So again, I used a prefix that I normally use for checkboxes, chk, and this is create draw because the caption is going to be create drawing, and depending on whether this is checked, a drawing will be created. So then the last thing I'm going to do is actually adjust the size of the user form just so this looks a little nicer. So I'm just dragging and dropping. And now I have the user form basically as I want it to look like to the user. So right now, if I were to uh, go back to my main sub procedure and run the macro, the user form wouldn't even appear. It would just run through the macro, all the code you're already familiar with. We would never see any trace of the user form. What do we need to change so that the user form will appear? Well, what we need to have happen is all of this code in here in this current uh, module, we need to have all of this code associated with the user clicking this add configuration button. So how do we do that? Well, all we're going to do is double click on that button and notice up here where it says object, we have a list of all the objects we added on that user form. So we're on CMD add. And then over here under procedure, we have all different kinds of things that can be done with that button. So for example, the user can click it, the user can double click it, the user can use their down arrows or up arrows, all kinds of things. But really the only one we're concerned about is click. And notice that was the one that popped up automatically when we double clicked on that command button. And that's just because this is the most common event associated with command buttons. So basically what we want is all this code back here, we want it to be associated with that button, which means we're just going to cut it out of here and then right click, go into view code and paste it in here. So with that, we now have an empty main sub procedure. And if I click run, nothing is going to happen at all. So again, the question still remains, how do I get this user form to appear? This is where you're going to type the name of the user form. So user form one dot, and then we're going to use a property called show. And there's one argument that this will accept, and it's basically an argument as to whether or not we want the user form to be modal. And if it's modal, that means you can't really click on anything else while it's up. You have to interact with it first before moving on. Otherwise, if we do want the user to be able to interact with SolidWorks while the user form is up, then we can do this. We'll type in VB modeless. Okay, how did I know to type that in? Well, basically, I just went to help. And if you type in show, that's the function I just showed you. And if we go down here, it says the settings for modal are VB modal. And notice that that's also the default and then VB modeless and user form is modeless. And again, that just refers to whether the user can interact with other applications in Windows while that user form is up. So now let's run this and we have the user form as we would expect. Now, at this point, I also want to stop and say that if you are in SolidWorks 2012 or earlier, it is very possible that when you run your macro from the run button, as opposed to the Visual Basic Editor, this user form will appear behind the SolidWorks application, in which case you actually need to use your Alt-Tab until 
you find it. So I know that's a little bit annoying and there are some workarounds to get it to come to the front, but unfortunately that's oh, well beyond uh, the scope of this series. So for now, you just need to know that if you run the macro from say the run button and everything just seems frozen and you can't really seem to click on anything, well, just use Alt-Tab and see if it's because the user form appeared behind the SOLIDWORKS window and it's waiting for you to interact with it. All right, so back to the user form itself. What can we do right now with the user form? Well, right now I could put in any string of characters or numbers I want. And when I click Add Configuration, the same thing that we've already seen is always going to happen. It's always going to create that configuration called test. The whole diameter is going to be 15 millimeters and it's going to create a drawing even though this isn't checked. So now we need to get this text box associated with some of the values in our code. And then we also need this to be associated with our code. And we're going to use a conditional statement basically to see whether or not this is checked. And if it's checked, we'll of course, continue on running our code related to creating the drawing. So for right now, if you want to click this and test it out, you're welcome to. You'll find that it just runs the code that we're already familiar with. So now that you're back in the code window, let's go back to the user form, right click on view code, and we want to associate the contents of that text box with this string and also this a double value. Because remember, whatever they enter in there, like let's say they enter 20, that's not only going to be the value in millimeters that is input as the diameter value, but it's also going to be the name of the configuration. So here's what we're going to do. Let's say right here, get text box text. And I'm going to declare a new variable and I'll call it dbl diameter, say as double. And what I'm going to do is say dbl diameter equals, and think back to what we named that text box. We named it txt diameter dot, and we're going to use the text property. And basically this is going to take whatever txt diameter, whatever that control is equal to in terms of its contents, its text, and it's going to set that equal to dbl diameter. Then what we're going to do is take dbl diameter and I'm going to put this in here in place of that test. And let's also go back up here and correct that spelling. Just notice I, I saw that that wasn't snapping into uppercase so I knew that something must have been spelled wrong along the way. And then let's also take this and replace that. So now when I save this, let's go ahead and go back to our main module and run this. And let's try doing 20 instead of 15. So now when I click Add Configuration, everything should run as I would expect, but uh, let's come back here and make sure that this is 20. And indeed it is 20. So now I'll go ahead and reload this and let's talk about where to go from here. So now we seem to have that text box working so we could move on to the create drawing button. However, let's talk a little bit more about that text box. Right now, what is stopping the user from entering say a negative value or a value so big that it would chop off the entire base like we saw earlier? Well, right now there's nothing stopping the user. So let's actually implement some error handling so the user cannot enter a value, we'll say less than two millimeters or above 25 millimeters. So let's go back in here to view code and let's do this. Let's say if DBL diameter less than or equal to two, or dbl diameter greater than or equal to 25, then and we'll put in our end diff and we'll say swapp send message to user. So kind of like what we're going to do up here. And actually, in fact, we could just copy this because it's basically going to be the same thing. We're going to send a message to the user that says, please specify a value between two and 25 millimeters. And then it's going to exit the sub and we're doing exit sub and not 
end so that the entire macro doesn't shut down and the user form will remain there in place and they can try entering another value. So let's save this. Let's go back, try running this, and let's go ahead and put in a zero. Click Add Configuration, and good. It works like we would expect. So let's put in a 25. And clearly something is still happening, so that tells me something is wrong with my code. Let's close out of this, exit out of this, we'll reload this come back here and take a look at what is going on and go back into the code and it's because I mistyped that in. So there we go. Now it should work just fine. So go ahead and save that and now let's move on to this create drawing checkbox. The create drawing text box is really only going to come into play after we we're done with uh, everything related to that initial part document. So um, right here, what we'll do is we'll say if chk create draw dot value equals true, then it's basically going to run all this code. And then at the very end, we'll put in an end if. And because I'm big into formatting properly, we will take all this and oops indent that in. So now it looks a little bit nicer. So basically I just know that uh, if we want to take a look at the value of the checkbox we need to use this value property and honestly th there'd be no point in me showing you how to use each control because it's so easy to just go onto Google and do something like checkbox control VBA and hit enter and it'll take you to all kinds of tutorials that shows you how to use checkboxes or any other control you can think of. So that's really how I learned how to use user forms properly. And so let's go ahead and test this out. So I'll run this and notice that it's not checked by default, uh, which if we wanted, we could go into that properties explorer back in the design window and we could change the value of this so that by default it's checked, but we'll just leave it the way it is. And if I enter in, we'll say 22, it should add in a new configuration, but notice it does not create a new drawing. So that's as we would expect. Now let's bump that up to 23. Let's click create drawing. And now let's do add configuration. It adds another configuration and it creates a drawing with the current configuration. So it looks like everything is working the way we want. Uh, finally, let's talk some about distribution of this macro. Let's say that you actually want some of your coworkers to be able to use this macro you just created. Uh, well, also, I should note that we need to go back into uh, the code and you might want to uncomment that now that we're actually trying to incorporate all of our original code and we're not leaving anything out for testing purposes. But anyway, once you have the code the way you want it, how would you distribute this to your users? Well, what I would recommend doing if you have multiple users using it and you wanted to kind of retain control of it is what I would do is I would put it on a network drive, but you might not want your coworkers to be able to look at the code or edit the code. So what you can do is you can come up here and go to the properties of your project and go into protection and you can click lock project for viewing. So we'll click that and I'll make a password and I'll just make the password password and click OK. And basically now what happens is when I close out of this, yes we will save changes, and I try to go back and edit it, I'll open it up and notice that it doesn't let me expand this and look in at the code unless I enter the password. So now I can look at the code. So this is a good thing you want to do before you distribute your macros. However, the password does not prevent people from running the macro. So I can still come down here to the run button and I change the open as type, then go up to support. Right there's my user form, just like I would expect. However, let's take it even further. Let's say that you distribute this to your users and you don't want them to have to keep going down to a macro toolbar and clicking run or going to tools, macro, and that kind of thing. Let me show you how to add a macro shortcut. What we're gonna do is go up to the command manager and right click and go down until you get to customize. 
and go into the command section. When you go into the command section, look for macro and you're going to see the five buttons you're already familiar with, but you also see new macro button. So click on this and drag it out to whatever toolbar you want or the command manager. And as soon as you release it, it's going to open up this. And the first thing you want to do is simply browse to that SWP file. So we'll double click on that. And then for method, drop this down. And if you have multiple sub procedures, they're going to show up in here. You always want to make sure that this is on the sub procedure that your macro needs to start with. So in our case, it's just called main. And uh, if you want, you can change the icon image, you can change the tooltip. So we'll call it add configuration and prompt will leave alone. So when I click OK, it adds my uh, shortcut up here. If you need to change it around later, you can always just right click on it and go to properties. But uh, anyway, at this point, now that I've added that, I can go up to add configuration and there's my user form and I can run my macro. And then if you want to avoid having to explain to all your users how to set up macro shortcuts, what you can do is use the, we go to SolidWorks, use the copy settings wizard and open that up and do save settings and go ahead and click yes, even if you have a session of SolidWorks already open. And what you can do is just save out your toolbar layout. And if you have your macro shortcut on your macro toolbar, then you can just choose a macro toolbar only and that way you're not really affecting any other settings. And then you click finish, you take that file, send it to your coworkers, they double click on it, it'll be loaded in. Of course, you want to make sure that the macro location is consistently at the same place on your network or consistently on the same place in each person's hard drive. And with that, we conclude our introductory look at the SolidWorks API. I hope you found this series useful and thanks for watching.